am very happy to be able to welcome you to this event, which is the first of our social sciences occasion lectures of the 16-17 season. And um, uh, my name is Nina Rosenstand, and I am a professor of philosophy here at Mesa College, and I chair the series of occasion lectures. And uh, that gets me to the point where I'm happy to be able to introduce our speaker, who is Danny M. Cohn, and he's a professor of instruction at Northwestern University. And he's also going to be a panelist in our symposium, and that is on uh, in uh, one of the Saturday uh, events. And today, we are also celebrating his new book, which is called Train. And this is indeed a book signing event because his book is available. Uh, if you turn around, you will see that we actually have a table with books, and they are available for sale and signing after the event. Dr. Cohen is a learning scientist um, with his PhD from uh, Northwestern University. And in addition to that, he uh, is commissioner on the Illinois Holocaust and Genocide Commission and uh, is a uh, faculty fellow at the Auschwitz Jewish Center, plus he's the founder of the Unsilenced Nonprofit Organization, which I'm sure we will be hearing something about. Uh, you may hear a slight trace of a British accent. Uh, he is from London, uh, England, <laughs> and uh, he's been in this country for 12 years, he told me. Uh, and the title of uh, his paper is Accidental Fiction, Finding and Writing Hidden Holocaust Histories. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nina. Hi, everyone. It's very, uh, uh, it's great to be here. I just, uh, I just landed uh, from Chicago. Um, it's good to be in San Diego. Um, uh, today, we're going to be talking about hidden stories of history. Um, and I'm, as, as Nina said, I'm a learning scientist by training. Uh, we study how people learn. Uh, most people in my field, many people will focus on how do people learn math, how do people learn to read, how do people learn science. I'm kind of an odd one out. I focus on how do people learn about, how do people learn prejudice, how do people learn hatred, how do people learn about genocide and human rights. Um, and so my style, as you'll see, uh, because I'm concerned with how people learn and how we can help people learn, um, I won't just be giving a straight lecture um, today. There'll be, there will be some interaction. Um, so I will be asking you to turn to the people next to you, maybe answering a question. Um, so I hope, I hope that's engaging and exciting for you. Um, I want to start by telling you a story. to something that happened to me a few years ago. And it's a story that I was told to never tell a story that I was told to keep secret. And for a number of years, I kept that secret until fairly recently I realized that I have a responsibility to tell everyone um, this story. Um, how many of you have visited any of the Nazi sites in Europe? Great, uh, a couple of you. Um, if any of you have visited the site of Auschwitz, which is perhaps the most infamous um, of the Nazi murder sites, um, in Auschwitz I, if you go at certain times of year um, uh, in Poland, uh, there are sometimes so many tourists that you have to wear headphones and you have to tune in to your tour guide's channel, because there are literally hundreds of tourists walking around the site. Um, and you, everyone has a guide. And if you didn't have your headphones, you would, you would lose track. Guides are talking in different languages. We have groups from all around the world. Many young people, many high school trips from around Europe um, are visiting. You have many groups from the United States, um, from really all around the world. Um, and my first time there, I was on a group trip um, with a group of other scholars and historians um, and, and educators. And we were there staying in the town of Oświęcim. Oświęcim is the Polish name of the town that was, um, uh, the, the name was changed to Auschwitz uh, by the Nazis. We were staying in Oświęcim for about a week. We were in Poland for a month, studying and learning the history in depth. Um, and we went to Auschwitz, and our first day 
we put on our headphones, we tune in to our tour guide's channel and we're following her through the site, listening, looking at the piles of shoes, looking at the barracks, looking at the piles of hair, um, and so on and so on. If those, if those images feel familiar to you. And at the end of the day, our tour guide turned around to us and said, okay, the tour is over for the day. What questions do you have? And one of my colleagues in our group turned around and said, I have a question. So far today, you haven't talked very much about the women prisoners at Auschwitz um, and the so-called brothel at Auschwitz. Many Nazi camps um, had what we might call brothels, um, where women prisoners were, were victims of, um, of extreme sexual violence and rape. Um, and so one of my colleagues said, yeah, could you talk about the women in the camp? Could you talk about um, the sexual violence that, that took place? Because so far you haven't mentioned that. And then another person in the group said, and also, could you talk about the homosexual prisoners in the camp? You haven't talked about them. At this point, our tour guide said, OK, everyone, that's the end of the tour. Please turn off your monitor and please give me your headset. And we looked at each other. And I remember thinking, like, what the hell is going on? She's not answering our questions. I want you to turn to the people around you. I realize, Professor, you have no one to speak to. You might have to move. <laughs> um, if you were in that situation yourself, you're on that guided tour, and the tour guide will not answer questions about sexual violence against women at Auschwitz, and would not answer questions about the homosexual victims at Auschwitz, how would you feel? What would you do? And what do you think is going on? So I invite you to turn to the people around you just for a minute. How would you feel? What would you do? And what do you think is going on? OK. I'm sorry to cut off what sounds like really great conversations. Um, but we're going to continue those conversations because I'm really, I'm really interested. I'm not so interested in just talking at you. I will be soon. I'll be telling you uh, uh, what happened to me. But first of all, I want to hear what you were talking about. Would anyone like to share? So my question was, um, how would you feel? What would you do? What's going on? Uh, and we can go anywhere here. Anyone want to just share anything that they, that they feel like saying out loud? Thank you. Um, so we were going to talk about our first reaction would be if we were in your situation. Obviously, you'd be really puzzled. Like, why is this something that she's suppressing? Um, we kind of came up with a couple of exam or ideas of, of why. Maybe it's the environment. She doesn't want to um, talk about these kinds of things in front of maybe kids and other people who are right around you. Okay. So you want to kind of. Um, kind of suppress that kind of harsh information. Um, you know, maybe, and probably kind of segments to what you're saying, it's, um, it's wrong to talk about it. You know, it's, um, you know, she keeps it hidden for a reason, and maybe a lot of other people keep it hidden for a reason. And, um, you know, at that point, she, she doesn't want to keep sharing it because it's, it's almost wrong to do it. So. Thank you. Anyone else want to share what you were talking about? Well, as a underling, maybe she has been instructed not to. Okay. Okay. By whom? By the institution that the tour was hired through. Okay. Thank you. Anyone else want to share what you were talking about? Either a theory of what of what's going on, or or what you would do? Did anyone talk about how would you respond? Is there something you would say? Yes. Um, I guess another thing would be maybe she doesn't know. Okay. Maybe she doesn't know maybe the answer. Maybe like she was never told. I, I just thought she might be Catholic, and it's just taboo to okay. talk about such things. Okay. Because it's Poland. Sure. Okay. Thank you. You know what else? Do you have a hand up? Oh, I mean, and I was thinking about, I mean, obviously, because I'm an academic, so from an academic perspective, you know, the tour guide was so quick to just dismiss the question. 
that would make me want to research that topic. Yeah, <laughs> well, let me go okay. research it myself. <laughs> yeah, right. yeah, good, good, good. So it might not be something you would do in that moment, but maybe it would actually lead you to do something yeah, afterwards. Something yeah, I love that. Uh, so this is what happened. So, so we'll unpause the scene. Um, so we reluctantly turn off our monitors and turn in our headsets. And we're still looking at each other, thinking like, like, like what? This is just ridiculous. We're a group of scholars. There is no one else around at this moment um, who can hear. Why isn't she telling us something that we already know? We already know parts of this history already. It's not so. Like you're not fooling us by telling us you can't answer these questions. What's going on? We turn our turn in our headsets, and she says, "Come here, everybody." And she says to us, you are, you are spot on. She says, there are certain things we're not allowed to talk about. Sometimes my supervisors tune in to our channels and listen in. If I talk about sexual violence against women, if I talk about the homosexual prisoners too much, I could lose my job, she says. And then she says, tomorrow, when we visit Auschwitz-Birkenau, the second camp, we won't have headsets because fewer people go there. Um, we don't need headsets. I'll be able to answer any question you have. Um, and, and, and she did the next day. But then she said to us, um, but please don't tell anyone that this happened. And for a number of years, I didn't until fairly recently, as I said, where I realized this is really important. It's important that we know that at historical sites, at a really important historical site in Poland today, the Polish authorities who oversee the historical site and train their tour guides, they have uh, certainly not a written formal policy. They have an informal policy of keeping certain stories hidden and silenced. And that's what we're going to be talking about today. And I'm going to be telling you about my work of unsilencing these hidden stories. I want to share with you a framework that I developed um, to try and make sense of this silencing and these, these hidden stories. Um, I'm, uh, I'm trained as a Holocaust educator. Uh, my work has focused on uh, Holocaust education. And over time as I was getting into my work, I kept coming up, kept sort of like um, hitting these walls where my colleagues would not talk about or were reluctant to include particular narratives within the trainings and programs that I was uh, designing. I'm, I'm a youth worker by training. I'm interested in uh, designing programs for teenagers to teach them about genocide and human rights. Um, and I would collaborate, I'd work alongside many um, professionals, and even when working with them, there were many moments where I would want to include a particular narrative, and a teacher or a designer or a museum developer uh, or exhibit designer would say, no, we, let's not go there, let's not go there. Um, one example, um, a more extreme example, is when I was putting together a program on the Nazis um, uh, different victim groups um, and I wanted to run a program, a part of the program about the Nazis persecution um, of people of African descent um, in Germany and Austria um, uh, many of whom, most of whom were forcibly sterilized in the 1930s and one of my colleagues who is an extremely influential Holocaust educator, and I won't say her name or what institution she was working for at the time, but when I suggested that we include these stories of uh, people of African descent under Nazism, she turned around to me and said, um, this time it's not about them. We don't need to include those stories here. And I realized that her explicit racism was getting in the way of her doing her job, right? Uh, the look I gave her, um, I think, told her that she just said the wrong thing to the wrong person. Um, and we went ahead and included those narratives. 
um, despite her obvious uh, uh, reluctance to do so. Um, and so over the years, I've come to look at uh, what are the different factors that lead to silencing. And I was listening to some of the things you were saying. I found three big buckets, um, if you like, um, of the factors that lead to historical silencing. And not just historical, but also um, contemporary issues of human rights as well. The first that many of you were talking about, I think, was what I call institutional silencing. So very official silencing through law, through institutional policy, government uh, silencing, whether that's official or, or um, implicit and hidden. Right? A formal body saying, we don't want these stories to be told. Governments deciding that a particular history is going to be remembered in a particular way. Right? And so the, uh, the Auschwitz tour guide being trained by her supervisor being told, don't talk about this. That's what we might call institutional silencing. Other examples might be not recognizing certain communities as victims of a particular atrocity. Right? Not granting reparations, refusing to recognize victims under the law. It right? would be another example of institutional silencing. Then we would have, uh, the second is what I would call cultural or social silencing. This includes taboos. Talking about, I know if some of you were talking about taboos. What is it okay to say out loud? Right? In many societies, particularly in the United States, sexual violence is a taboo. Things are changing in certain spheres, perhaps, right? um, but it's still pretty much taboo, especially in a, in a high school environment. Many teachers have expressed to me they want to teach about sexual violence. They think it's important that their students do, but they're scared of what parents will say. They're scared of how to do it. They don't know how to approach it. Right? Um, and then finally, uh, the third sphere, if you like, um, is what I call personal silencing. And this is, I think, in, there are probably two sides of the coin. One is that individuals may have a very particular prejudice that stops them from talking about something or a particular issue. The other side of the coin is individuals who have experienced trauma, who may feel extreme shame or embarrassment about talking about their own stories. And so these stories that should be told become hidden, not because anyone says they need to be hidden, but because individuals don't feel comfortable to speak openly about uh, what has happened to them. Right? Um, and in the, particularly the cases of homosexual survivors of Nazism and survivors of uh, sexual violence under Nazism, that's certainly the case. Survivors, homosexual survivors and women who were raped um, during the war, um, we don't have very much testimony. We don't have uh, many stories, um, most likely because of this personal uh, silencing. And of course, all of those three are connected. Right? The personal silencing may well be because of this cultural taboo, and that may well be driven by this institutional silencing too. So where does my work fit? My work fits, I would say, within the second sphere, um, this cultural silencing. And I saw it as my job um, to, after these kinds of experiences, I saw it as my job to break open these stories, to unsilence these hidden stories. Um, I'm a learning scientist, I'm an education designer, and I started to, to design these curricula for high school level where teachers in Illinois and a number of other states, including California, um, uh, are mandated to teach Holocaust history in high school. Um, and where there was this opportunity for teachers who, when they teach about the Holocaust, would usually only teach about the Jewish narrative. And that's, in my, that's my training. I grew up in the Jewish community. I was trained as a Jewish educator and a Holocaust educator. Um, but I saw this opportunity that we could help teachers expand the narrative that's being told in the classroom to include all of these other hidden stories that I believe needed to be told. Why do they need to be told? Because 
the silencing of some of these narratives, silencing of what happened to homosexuals in the Nazi camps, the silencing of sexual violence against women, the, the modern day silencing is not really about history. It's really about what's happening today. People who say we, can't, we shouldn't talk about this history, it's usually, I believe, a reflection of a reluctance to address those same ongoing issues, that same ongoing oppression and same specific forms of prejudice that still exist today. If the Polish government allows their tour guides to talk about homosexuals and sexual violence against women, then surely they would need to also acknowledge that they need to protect women and the LGBT community in Poland today, which we know they're reluctant to do. Right. Um, so I started to develop these uh, curricula, um, and I was sharing them with teachers, and I started to receive feedback from teachers who said, what you're designing, the, the lesson plans and the activities, to be honest, they're really dry. They're kind of boring. Um, and I, we don't think that, sure, we could try piloting them in our classrooms, but we don't think we could really implement them. They're not going to be used very widely. And I said, OK, great. This is great feedback. I, I want feedback, of, and I don't want to waste my time designing something that's never going to be used. I said, what would be useful? And the teacher said, well, we often teach using film or fiction. Could you recommend some film or fiction um, that we could use? Um, and at, at that time, I was developing uh, programs to, to help teachers teach about um, not only the Jewish victims of Nazism, but also the Roma and the disabled and homosexuals and political dissidents and um, African, uh, victims of African descent, and all of these other groups. There are something like, if we add them all together, there are something like 22 or 23 distinct groups that the Nazis targeted. We don't usually hear about them. Right? You might be able to think of others as, as I'm talking. Um, and so they said, do you have any film or fiction? And I said, yeah, sure. And I gave them a list of uh, movies and documentaries and novels and short stories, and the teacher said, no, 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 no. We don't have time to teach one documentary about the Roma, and one novel about homosexuals, and one novel about the disabled. Is there a film or a novel that includes all of them together? And I said, no, I don't think there is. But let me see what I can do. Um, I didn't have the budget to produce a film. <laughs> Uh, but I did have the time and I did have the interest in developing some fictional vignettes, um, uh, some short stories that could be taught together. And to cut a long story short, I accidentally wrote um, a novel. Uh, those short stories became Train. Um, but as I was writing it, I started to question the ethics of creating what we would call Holocaust fiction. But these are all the different groups that the Nazis uh, targeted. They're, they're listed here in alphabetical order. So between 1933 and 1945, the Nazi regime and its collaborators persecuted for distinct reasons and indistinct ways. Many groups of people, including people of African descent, alcoholics, people of so-called Asiatic descent, dissenting clergy, uh, criminals and perceived criminals, communists, socialists, social democrats, and political dissidents, people with real and perceived mental and physical disabilities, emigrants and foreign forced laborers, Freemasons, the homeless, male homosexuals and perceived homosexuals, intellectuals, Jehovah's Witnesses, people of Jewish descent, lesbians, pacifists, people of Polish descent, prostitutes, people of Sinti or Roma descent, as well as other so-called gypsies, people of Slavic descent, Soviet prisoners of war, trade unionists, women, so-called useless eaters, including some geriatrics, bombing victims, and injured German soldiers, and Croatian, Serbian, Jewish, Muslim, and Roma victims of the Jasenovic camp complex persecuted by the collaborating um, Ustasha authorities. Um, uh, just to uh, uh, make it clear, this might be an artifact that 
you are familiar with. How many of you have seen this chart? It's often on display in different Holocaust museums. A couple of you, you have a few hands up. Um, so we know that in some camps, the Nazis had very specific categorization um, of, uh, of their prisoners. Anyone know uh, which each color, what the different colors stand for? Yeah, so the Nazis, if, you, if you've ever been to a gay pride parade, um, you've seen the pink triangle, Lady Gaga's Born This Way video begins with uh, the symbol of the pink triangle uh, oscillating over and over again. The pink triangle was created by the Nazis um, for use in the camps. The LGBT community appropriated the triangle, in some cases turning it up, pointing upwards as a symbol of defiance and of pride. Um, uh, but we have this classification system. We have red for communists, political dissidents, green for criminals, blue for emigrants, uh, purple for Jehovah's Witnesses, pink for homosexuals, black for so-called asocials, including Roma, and brown for other groups of Roma. Um, one line in this chart, um, if you have seen this before, that's often uh, uh, ignored or, or not noticed, is this chart here. Um, so in 1979, President Carter, uh, uh, his administration were, um, were really responsible for setting up what eventually became the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum in Washington, D.C. How many of you have been to the D.C. Museum or the other side of the country? Yeah, a couple of you have. Um, this, uh, it took many years for this museum to, uh, to be built. Um, and uh, President Carter placed who? Who was the president of this committee that eventually became the museum? Any guesses? Wiesenthal? No, not Wiesenthal, the other one. <laughs> Elie Wiesel. Wiesel, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So Elie Wiesel, who um, was this well-known uh, Holocaust survivor and writer and scholar, um, he wrote Night, many of you may have, may have read Night. He was placed as president of this committee and very quickly there was this discussion around how should we define the Holocaust. And the Carter administration put out a different definition that said, and I'm paraphrasing, the Holocaust was the um, state-sponsored attempt to murder all the Jews of Europe as well as uh, Roma and disabled and, um, and all these other groups. And Elie Wiesel said, um, if this definition sticks, I will step down as chairman. The definition of Holocaust should only apply to the Jewish victims. And Elie Wiesel said, if you don't change the, de the definition, I will step down as chairman. This is 1979. In response to Wiesel threatening to step down if the definition wasn't changed, Simon Wiesenthal, who was another Holocaust survivor, uh, uh, the so-called Nazi hunter, he was responsible for helping to bring um, Nazi uh, perpetrators to justice uh, after the war. Um, Simon Wiesenthal gave an interview with the Washington Post in 1979 where he said, um, we have reduced the problem to one between Nazis and Jews. And by doing so, we have lost many friends who suffered with us, whose families share common graves. So what Simon Wiesenthal is saying, Simon Wiesenthal is saying, we cannot tell the story of the Holocaust unless we include all of these groups. So Simon Wiesenthal was arguing against Elie Wiesel. What was the solution? The solution was one of punctuation. The crafters of the definition very carefully placed a semicolon in the definition. It said the Holocaust was the state-sponsored attempted annihilation of the Jews of Europe, semicolon, the Nazis also persecuted and tried to murder all these other groups. So the semicolon, if any, uh, any uh, grammar uh, fans out there know, it's an ambiguous uh, 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 symbol. And 
you can read the definition two ways. Maybe the definition stops before the semicolon, or maybe the sentence uh, goes on. And so everyone was happy. What I like to point to is this chart here that shows what? What are we looking at right here? I think we can zoom in. What are we looking at? Stars of David. So what does it, if someone is given this symbol? They're a Jewish as well. Yeah, they're, they're a political prisoner and a Jewish prisoner at the same time. Right? The Nazis acknowledged that it's impossible to separate victim, victim groups, it's impossible to separate target groups. Right? There are many individuals that fell into multiple categories, and we even have um, other categories where we have other symbols being added for nationality and, and so on and so on and so on. So um, this is, uh, these overlapping triangles became the title of the curriculum. Um, and that curriculum is now the launch curriculum of um, our new nonprofit, Unsilence, um, where we're focused on developing programs to um, to uncover and unsilence these hidden stories of human rights and atrocity, particularly at the high school level. Um, so what was my question to you? My question to you um, was around fiction. Um, so I started to write Train as a way to bring these stories into classrooms where teachers didn't have the resources or the know-how of how to include these many victim groups as a way to address all these other different forms of prejudice, right? Um, I remember one teacher saying to me, well, can't we just teach about anti-Semitism and the Jews? Like, why do we need to include all of these other groups? And um, I remember this amazing conversation that we had a group of teachers. And we asked, we, we, we responded by saying, well, how many, I ask you right now, how many of you know somebody who stands up against racism but is actually also transphobic? Right? I definitely know someone. <laughs> I can think of many people who, are, who would say, I am not a racist, but they're, at the same time, they're pretty transphobic. How many of you who know, know somebody who would stand up against, stand up for women's rights, stand up against sexism, but at the same time is Islamophobic. I can definitely think of some people, right? Prejudice does not transfer easily. When we, when we break down one form of prejudice, it doesn't automatically mean that we break down all other forms of prejudice. They exist somewhat independently. They're connected, absolutely, but they exist often independently for individuals, right? If, we, if Holocaust education is only about teaching anti-Semitism, I think we're fooling ourselves into thinking that Holocaust education is a way to address all forms of prejudice at once. We have to include all these different forms of prejudice and we have to tell the stories of all these different victim groups in order to, um, to help people understand each form of prejudice as they stand individually and to, and to begin to break them down. Um, and so, as I started to write Train, um, I was concerned that the, the criticism of writing fiction in the context of genocide includes concerns around, well, are we going to misrepresent the history? Are we going to misrepresent the experience? And it was Elie Wiesel who said that we can never truly understand the Holocaust experience and by extension, we can never really understand what it's like to survive a genocide unless we have actually been there ourselves. And even survivors say they don't fully understand the experience of being targeted for mass murder. Right? Um, and so how can we possibly represent this complex, extreme history in the form of fiction? Um, and so I spent many years um, working on this and making sure that not only was the history accurate, but also that the experiences reflected um, in the um, fictional characters I was creating was reflected in testimony um, that, that I researched um, and watched and read 
um, to make sure that everything here is authentic. Right? Um, I want to get into train. I just want to check. Oh, good. Okay, good. Got about uh, 12 minutes left, um, and then and then we can move into questions. Um, I want to just share with you um, a couple of um, characters. Um, inside train that I put in there for teachers to bring into their classrooms to start to unpack really difficult questions about this history. Um, there's one character in here. Uh, her name is Elise. She's 15 years old. Um, we first meet her um, uh, on a winter's day. She's wearing a heavy overcoat. It's 1943. It's Berlin. And she's walking through uh, the market on the way home. And she's covering up something that um, anyone who can see her doesn't know what she's wearing underneath her coat. And when she gets home, she takes off her coat uh, to reveal her Nazi youth uniform. She's a member of the Nazis Girls League. Um, and we learn more about Elise. Again, she's 15. We learn that her father is missing in action. He is a German soldier at Stalingrad. This is just a few weeks after Stalingrad, but they haven't heard from him. He's perhaps dead. Uh, she's somewhat in denial. She expects that he's going to be coming home. Um, but her father is a German soldier. And we learn that her mother, uh, with whom she lives, um, is a Nazi sympathizer. Um, she's anti-Semitic. She harbors uh, racist views against uh, Roma people as well, so-called gypsies. Um, and so Elise and her family, they're a fairly typical German family, right? Elise, she's, she has her Girls' League uniform. She's required, in fact, um, all so-called Aryan children aged 10 and above were, were required to go along to the Nazi youth meetings as part of the uh, Nazi's program of indoctrination of all of society, including youth. Um, so she, uh, she's a member of the Girls League. Her father is a German soldier. Her mother is an anti-Semite. And it's a little spoiler I'm going to give you. We discover um, later in the novel that her younger brother, Victor, um, died a few years earlier, and, we, and Elise discovers, and we sort of see her discover it, she discovers that he was murdered because he had a mental disability and that he was murdered by Nazi doctors. Right? And suddenly, the trauma of her family becomes clear. Her, uh, the tensions between her and her mother become clear. Her fears about her father on the front become clear. I'd like to ask you this question. I'd like to, you to turn to the people next to you. Where do we place Elise and her family? Are they perpetrators? Are they collaborators? Are they Nazis in that sort of classic sense? Or because Victor, the child of the family, was murdered by Nazi doctors, are they victims in some way? Are they both? Or are they something else? Turn to the people next to you. Where do we place Elise and her family? I'm going to interrupt you. I'm, you're going to continue this conversation, but I want to share with you now the story of another character. And then I'm going to let you continue the same conversation. Another character in Train. Her name is Tsura. She's 19. She's a member of um, a political dissident group. Um, she's living with false papers in Berlin. And we find out very early on in the book that uh, Tsura is Roma, um, so-called gypsy. Her family are being held in an encampment on the edge of Berlin, an encampment called Marzan. Um, what happened in Berlin in 1936? Anyone know? It was the Olympics. The Olympics in Berlin. The, the whole, yeah, right, under, under Nazism. Uh, Jesse Owens, right, he, 
he he ran. He competed. It was uh, there's there's a, a recent film uh, uh, that you should that, that's worth watching. Um, in 1936, in preparation for the Olympic Games, the Nazis, even though they were already oppressing all these people, they sort of decided they would clean up their, their capital to make it palatable for the world. They reopened gay bars that had been closed down. They took down signs that prohibited Jews from entering parks and cafes and using benches and walking on the sidewalk and, and so on and so on. Um, and one thing they also did was they decided that the Roma populations in the city of Berlin, they would clear out and make the, the um, city look more pretty. And they established these temporary encampments on the edge of Berlin. The first was called Marzahn. And they told the Roma, don't worry, don't worry, you're just here for the summer while the Olympic Games are happening. You'll return to your homes afterwards. What happened? Those encampments became permanent. So Tsura, many years later, 1943, is trying to work on a plan to free her family from this encampment on the edge of Berlin. She's living with false papers in the city. She's, she's kind of our, she's, our, she's one of the main protagonists. She's our hero of the story. Um, uh, we find out, we see later in the story, that Sura discovers that another character, I don't want to give too, too much away, another character in the book is homosexual. And her response is deeply homophobic. Deeply homophobic, her immediate response. Right? Where do we place Sura? So I want to go back to your conversations for a moment. Right? You were talking about Elise. Where do we place Elise? Now where do we place Sura? We have this, this hero. She's fighting for the Roma. She's fighting for the resistance, but she's deeply homophobic. Where do we place her? I want to wrap up. And after I wrap up, there'll be opportunity for, for conversation and questions. But I just want to wrap up my formal presentation. Um, so train is um, being taught in, uh, in classrooms around the country um, from middle school up to the college level, which is really exciting. Um, and teachers are, are using our online resources that accompany the book to ask these really hard questions to their students. Um, the kinds of questions that, we took, we, that I gave you today. Um, there's no real answers to many of these questions. I think that's it's important that there, there are no answers. The realization that there are no easy answers is a lesson in itself, I think. Um, when we look at all of these different victim groups under Nazism, I believe we suddenly have this opportunity to look at how complicated and messy um, these concepts of victim, perpetrator, bystander really are. It was Hilberg that came up with that paradigm, right? Have you heard of that before? Victim, perpetrator, bystander. And it's helpful to just get our head around these ideas, but actually it's extremely simplistic, right? The truth is when we look at what's actually happening on the ground, not just in the Holocaust, but also today, what's happening in Syria, what's hap what happened in Rwanda, what happened in Bosnia, um, what happened in, what's happening, it, uh, continues to happen in Darfur. We, and we look at our own relationship as bystanders, whether that's as individuals or as an international community, right? It, it doesn't really work just to fit people into these neat boxes of victims, perpetrators, bystanders, collaborators. Sometimes we move across different um, categories. Sometimes we exist um, in di multiple categories at the same time. Um, train is being, uh, has been uh, well received and our, our accompanying resources are being used, um, uh, which is very exciting to see it happen. We have, for example, a web quest called Hidden Pages, um, where students have to solve a series of puzzles to uncover the history that's hidden inside Train. Um, you can, all of this is open access. You can just go on uh, to our website and complete this for yourself. It's uh, uh, best done, hidden pages is best done when you're working with at least one other person. Otherwise, it can be a little too hard. Um, but it's, it's, it's created for middle school and up. Um, but we're finding that uh, more adults are using it. Uh, members of the public are using it, which is really exciting. Um, 
while I was writing Train, I used Google Maps and Google Earth to make sure that I was plotting the story properly. And that those maps that I was using then became this interactive map on Google Maps Live. And so all of these blue points are where different things, different moments of the novel um, uh, happened. And so this is a map of the book, if you like. And you can follow the map and follow where different characters are going to go. Uh, the, the story is a thriller. Um, and so there are chases, and people are hiding. And, and um, I intentionally wrote it as a page turner. I wanted to create something that was extremely accessible for young people that didn't feel dry and encyclopedic, but actually felt like a, a, a great story that was historically all accurate. And so you can use this map. Um, and then we also have um, an art um, exhibit um, by uh, artist Sarah Ramirez. Um, who illustrated moments um, from, um, uh, from the story, um, which is really exciting. We also have um, uh, non-fiction uh, features, including uh, testimonies of Roma survivors of the Nazi camps. Um, and you can go in and read testimony of, um, of these Roma, Roma women um, who were interviewed by uh, sociologist Michelle Kelso. And these women, um, and some men, had never told their stories for decades. No one had ever asked them to tell their stories. And then suddenly, um, they have the opportunity to do so. Um, that's really exciting. Um, and finally, that we also have a, uh, a I don't know, some of you may not remember. I remember from the 1980s, you know those Choose Your Own Adventure? Novels. Oh, yeah. Does that sound familiar, right? Where you're like, you're, you're you are the the character, and you're told, do you want to, do you want to go left or right? If you want to go left, turn to page twenty two. If you want to go right, turn to whatever, right? And so we created, I created, I wrote this mystery called the Nineteenth Window. That's a choose your own pathway mystery. Uh, that's fiction, historical fiction. Um, uh, that's all, all connected to the stories in Train. It's a different story, uh, but, it's, but it's connected. Similar themes, um, similar history. Um, I'll end with, uh, I'll end on a, on a downer. <laughs> um, even though Train is getting uh, lots of uh, teachers interested and people, and people are picking it up and teaching these stories for the first time, in these districts um, and schools that have never taught about um, uh, these different victim groups and these different forms of prejudice before. There are still many communities that are not only reluctant and scared to teach these histories, but just refuse. Um, I had one school who were very excited to find a book that talked about the Nazis' disabled victims. And 10 teachers came to my training and read train. Um, and when they got back to me about doing a pilot program, the head of their group got on the phone with me. And she said, I'm sorry, but we're not going to be teaching train. Um, and she said, um, I said, OK, that's fine. I, I, I'm really interested to know why. I'd love your feedback. And she said, well, there are, there are moments that reference sexual violence. And I don't think we can deal with this. I said, oh, OK. I understand. And we talked through it. We talked through it. And towards the end of the conversation, she turned around to me and said, OK, I'm not really telling you the whole truth. I said, oh? She said, the sexual violence thing would make it difficult for us to teach the book. But really, it's because of the gay character in the book. And we can't teach it in our high school. Um, this is what we're still facing, right? Um, where these stories that we want to be taught. We want to bring these questions, and not only this history, but also contemporary issues of human rights and social justice. We want to bring them to young people. But unfortunately, there are still many adults standing in the way. Um, but we're, we're working slowly, and um, uh, it's, it's still exciting work. Um, I invite you, as I said, to go, on, go online. You can sign up, follow us on Facebook, sign up. Um, uh, as a member, it's all for free, and you get full access um, to everything we're building. We have some really exciting uh, programs coming out soon. 
um, explicitly about sexual violence, um, about the history of sterilization in the United States, about mass incarceration in the United States, more contemporary issues. Um, it's really exciting. Thank you very much. We, I am, we're going to move into Q&A now, but that's the end of my uh, official uh, 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 I know that some of you may need, may need to leave, so uh, thank you for thank participating. You. Thank you. Good to meet you. Uh, question first. Yes. Question first. Yeah. Okay. Then, uh, this is about my paper, Social Sciences, the way we army. <laughs> but is learning sciences, is that a subset of the cognitive sciences? So, Learning sciences is its own thing. I wouldn't call it a subset, but there were cognitive scientists who were the founding members of the learning sciences. If I get my, if I know my history, the learn, the first learning sciences department was at Northwestern. Um, there are now many learning sciences programs around the world. Um, Northwestern has just started one of the first undergraduate programs in learning sciences. We sit within the School of Education and Social Policy. Um, uh, but as, as I understand it, it was founded by sociologists, cognitive scientists, education designers, psychologists, all people from, it's very interdisciplinary, and it still is very interdisciplinary. Many people in the learning sciences will hold joint positions um, in, different, in different departments, if that, if that helps okay. at all. But cognition, in my program, there are three strands of the learning sciences. Cognition is one, how individuals learn. Uh, social context, how we learn as groups. And design, which is how can, how can we support learning. So cognition, social context, and design. And so we have certainly many cognitive scientists very interested in the cognition piece. Um, yeah. More questions? Any questions? Yes. You said that you are of Jewish descent or uh -huh. group the Jewish community. Yes. Um, I don't know if you'd mind sharing if there's any personal stories that you yeah. kind of to this? Yeah, I'd be happy to share. Um, as a kid, I think I always just sort of grew up knowing that the whole, like, I, I, there was never one moment where I sort of, like, suddenly learned about the Holocaust. I think it was always there, yeah. um, which is pretty, so, it's somewhat common, I think, for children within communities who have a history of oppression and atrocity. Um, not just the Jewish community. Uh, so it was always there. And then at some point, I suppose I came to realize that my family was connected. Uh, my grandfather, uh, I, never, I never met him. He died when my mom was, was young. Um, he escaped Nazi-occupied Amsterdam um, when he was in his 20s, I believe. Um, he managed to get to London. Uh, and as far as we know, um, most of his family were murdered um, in the Nazi camps. When I was 18, I was in Jerusalem. This is before all um, Holocaust and Nazi records were digitized. Um, in, in Jerusalem at Yad Vashem, which is Israel's um, Holocaust Museum and Memorial, it's the National Memorial, it's the largest um, Holocaust Museum and Memorial complex in the world. Um, with DC being number two and the Illinois Holocaust Museum being number three. Um, uh, Museum of Tolerance, is, I think it's number four in, uh, in, in LA. Um, I was in Jerusalem as a teenager and I went up to the archives and I went up to the woman behind the desk and I said, hi, I'm here to look for my family. And she laughed at me. <laughs> she said, oh yeah, you and everyone else wants to look for their family. You're never going to find them. And I was like, okay, uh, I'd like to try. And she was like, okay, what's She said, uh, uh, unless I have an unusual name, you're never going to find it. And I said, Zikonot Passage. And she said, what? <laughs> Zikonot Passage. She was like, well, that's an unusual name. Okay, that increases the chances of you finding them. Just, you're still never going to find them. And I was like, okay. She said, unless they were Dutch. And I said, yeah, they were Dutch. She said, oh, okay. Uh, because apparently the Nazi occupiers in, in Amsterdam specifically were excellent record keepers and almost every person who was deported from Amsterdam and other Dutch cities um, are recorded. And when I revealed, when I said the name Ziekenopasser and I said that my family was Dutch, she stopped laughing. She grabbed my arm and she led me to what I call in my head sort of the books of the dead. <laughs> this is before digitization, so we have literally 
books and books and books. This is like just like this huge, huge, huge record. And the last book on the shelf, because my family's name uh, is Zikano Pasa, it begins with a Z or a Z, as we would say. Okay. On the, one of the final pages, we found um, Zikano Pasa, Zikano Pasa, Zikano Pasa, dates of birth, names, um, dates of deportation, um, the <coughs> camp that they were sent to, either Auschwitz or Sobibor, and their date of murder. I then, um, this, this woman, she was amazing, she then took, but I wasn't really allowed to touch it, she took the book and she made photocopies. I remember faxing the photocopies to my uncle. We don't know if there are family members. We're pretty sure they are, but we may never know. The, the, there was just no one left to verify whether or not they were our family. So we think they're our family. We don't know the stories of our family on my mother's side who were murdered um, in the Holocaust. And, and, and uh, we, Nina and I were talking about this earlier. I, I think, just to sort of psychoanalyze myself, <laughs> I think maybe this idea of sort of the that I can't find the stories of within my own family and that they're hidden and out of reach. I wonder if that has led me to unsilence these other stories. There's something in me that, that I want to uncover stories. Uh, my other connection um, uh, to the history, uh, and this is when I first, so it's, it was 2005. Um, this was the first year that the international community had recognized International Holocaust Remembrance Day on January 27th, which is the anniversary of the liberation of Auschwitz and auschwitz Birkenau. Uh, front page of the New York Times, um, Dick Cheney, Tony Blair from the UK, um, Elie Wiesel, all of these world leaders and well-known uh, uh, scholars came to the site of Auschwitz to recognize the 60th anniversary of the liberation of Auschwitz. This was in 2005. And I was writing a paper at the time on Holocaust memory. I was, I, I just come to the United States. It was just my first few months here. And two days later, it emerged um, that one community was not allowed to participate in that ceremony. And that was the LGBT community. Um, so I'm gay, I read, the gay press, and I came across this story, and I came to the realization that I grew up in a Jewish community, I'd been taught for so many years about the Jewish story of the Holocaust. And here I was also a member of the LGBT community, but no one had ever told me about the history of the Nazis' persecution of homosexuals. And that triggered for me this, I guess, this real need to know it and to learn it, and so I, I read, and I read, and I read, and that led me to ask the question, why is it that this part of the history is excluded from classrooms, and excluded from memorials, and excluded from museums? Why don't people talk about this? Why is it that tour guides in Auschwitz are told, don't talk about this? And then that expanded, and suddenly I became very interested in this idea of silencing and unsilencing. Um, and then that led to training, and that led to Nonprofit non profit So that's my long answer to, uh, to a very good question. Okay. Other questions? Well, I have a couple of questions, two questions. Um, is this a project um, only in the K-12 system in the United States, or are you also outreaching to other places of the world? Yeah. And then uh, the second question is, I mean, that, that you mentioned the Holocaust Museum in, uh, in Israel, and you, you discussed uh, debates that they had about how we, they were going to conceptualize the Holocaust in the United States. So how, how is it portrayed in Israel? I mean, how are they, yeah, when right. you go to the museum in Israel, I mean, how is it yeah. shown to the public? Good, good, good. Um, so to, to two, I'll, I'll, to, to your first question, um, everything is online. And so we are seeing that people outside of the United States are accessing this. Oh, On silence, we only became a 501c3 nonprofit last year. We're very, very, very new. Um, we, we do already have partners in Germany, Poland, um, the UK, Israel, France, Canada. These are people we're starting to talk to, um, uh, to bring this. So yes, our intention is for this to be an international uh, non-profit agency where we develop 
uh, not only original programs where artists and writers and educators can also contribute their own research, their own work, and we would work with them to give voice to these these stories. So if you know, if you yourself or you know other people that have uh, doing amazing research here um, that you think could be uh, uh, brought into on silence in some way, we want to hear from you. You can actually, on the community, you can um, uh, submit a proposal. It's very early days, so we, we have limited resources, but we are working on really growing this. So that, that's to answer your first question. The second question is about Israel. Um, Holocaust education in Israel is unique in that, and I think this goes for the Jewish community in general, when the Holocaust is taught around the world, in classrooms in the United States, it's usually taught as a warning that we as society need to prevent future genocides, usually, right? In, and so the study of bystanderism, the study of perpetrators, is often included in some way in Holocaust education in your average school. In Israel and in the Jewish community, the story is very much from the victim's perspective, right? Um, because it's a uh, the people who are developing the curricula are sometimes children or grandchildren of, or sometimes they are even survivors themselves. Right? They're telling their own stories of survival, um, and that's really important and valid and, and unique about Holocaust education in Israel and the Jewish community. This makes Holocaust education in Israel really fascinating and, and maybe even problematic because if you're only looking at the history from a victim's point of view, then are you actually giving young people in your communities and in your schools the opportunity to, to think about bystanders and perpetrators or are those perspectives being ignored? And so, um, so in certain institutions, Yav Vashem being one, um, the Imperial War Museum of London being another, the definition that we were talking about before of the Holocaust only refers to the Jewish victims. Mm. The other victims are not part of the Holocaust, of Holocaust history. This is where definitions become really important because if we mandate Holocaust education, where did it, it really matters how we define Holocaust. Because if we're mandating, mandating Holocaust education, but the definition of, of a Holocaust victim is only someone who is Jewish, then suddenly we've automatically excluded the disabled and homosexual and Roma and all these other groups that we should be talking about as well. Um, um, and so the, the Yad Vashem recently, in their new design, they do now include, they reference Roma, homosexual, disabled victims, but it's like, it's on the wall, just in one corner. There's no stories about individuals, it's just a, a summary of that. And it's, it's not considered to be part of Holocaust history. It's considered to be Nazi genocide uh, or Nazi atrocities. Uh, it's separate from the Jewish narrative, which, as, as I explained, as Sam Wiesenthal argues, is deeply problematic. Every country, every, every country in its education system has an, has an obligation to teach about all these different points of view when it comes to uh, genocide, whether that be victim, perpetrator, collaborator, bystander, rescuer, liberator, um, and so on and so on. If, as we know, if Israel is, uh, uh, if a country doesn't, doesn't teach from all these different perspectives, then we lose the opportunity to have particular conversations with young people and, and as a society. Right. And so, yeah, I think it's a, um, I think it's a problem. I, I know there are scholars. Um, in, it's not like this history is ignored. Um, there are, histor there are uh, historians and scholars who are working hard to expand the narrative of the Holocaust um, in Israel. So things are, things are happening. Uh, but as far as I know, it's, it's not easy. I mean, a particular culture or tradition develops, and that's just the way things are done. It's very hard to 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 change stories. It's very hard to change narratives. Yes. Um, so I'm just gonna say I just wanted to make a comment. If that's alright. Yeah. Of um, 
So I, I do have to get going, but I was going to go buy your book, and I just wanted to say that, um, you know, I kind of grew up, and I, I've always been very interested in the Holocaust, but I have grown up thinking um, the only people that were suppressed in it was the Jewish community and the disabled community, um, partly because the disabled community, partly because I grew up um, kind of in the disabled community and, and knew a lot of their suppressions. And I just wanted to commemorate you for for kind of bringing to light kind of everybody else and wanted to include you know every group and I think that's really important, especially you know we're American citizens. You know we're kind of melting pot of every culture, no matter what. There's probably aspects of, of every culture in our in our um, in our nation, and I think it's very important that as American citizens you don't think of it as one perspective, you think of it as everybody's perspective. So. Thank you, thank you very yeah. much. And just to respond to that, and I think maybe this is my love, I think we've run out of time. Oh, yeah. oh we haven't? Oh, we have more time. Okay, we can keep going. Uh, but I, I, to respond to, to that, there is a fear. So I, when I talk to a lot of teachers, I talk to Holocaust educators, and we have some real talk, and we say, okay, why is it that these victim groups are often excluded from, from memorials and museums and classrooms and materials? I think there's a fear that if we universalize all of these victim experiences, that the Jewish story will become swept aside, right? And in our work with Unsilence, particularly with overlapping triangles, something that we make sure that we always do, we do this in our training, is to help teachers avoid what we would call the sort of false, um, false universalism, if you like. The Nazis persecuted each of these groups for very different reasons and in different ways. Right? Um, and every community, even though there are overlaps, and even though there are connections and similarities, um, for example, um, the Nazis castrated homosexual, some homosexual prisoners. Why did they castrate them? Because at one point in Nazi history, they perceived homosexuals as being curable. They could be cured, right? Jews were not perceived as ever being curable. Roma could never be cured. People of African descent could never be cured, right? And so we have to actually draw a distinction between the Nazis' um, attempt to get rid of homosexuality and cure it, but there was never a policy to gas homosexuals, right? So it's important, there, were, there was, um, and so this is what we have with these myths developing, right? The Nazis gassed all of these groups. No, 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 they didn't. They had very distinct policies for how to treat each group. And that's why they labeled them? Yes, yeah, um, in part. There are many reasons yeah. why they labeled them in the camps. One was to also create a sense of uh, infighting amongst the prisoners, right? Okay. If, you, if you create tension between pe different people you're oppressing, then they're going <coughs> to waste time fighting each other and maybe not worry about fighting you so much. Right? Okay. So we have these, these sort of like infighting in the, in the camps. But yes, also, they were, they were categorized because there were different policies and different um, uh, genocidal actions uh, against each different group um, at different times. And these continue to change as well. Uh, the Nazi era, we're talking 12 years. and so. 12 years is a long time, the policies are changing um, all the time. And so we have to avoid this false universalism um, and focus on what makes all of these experiences distinct while also paying attention to what connects them. Uh, I have a question. Yeah, sure. Um, your characters in the book, yeah. uh, obviously you're saying that it's, it's fiction and it is accidental fiction because yeah. apparently it wasn't the way it started out. Uh -huh. uh, but how much are they a composite of actual stories and yeah. how much are you pulling them out of, yeah. of your research? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I would say that I, I read so, I, I, as I said, I, I never intended to write them. A novel, and I've been teaching Holocaust history for so long that, of course, they are inspired by real stories. But there's no character, there's no main character that's based on one particular person. There are there are other secondary characters who uh, are real people, or sort of placeholders. 
for real people in history, but the protagonists are not. Um, but, uh, and that, that, I guess, is, is where the part of the reluctance comes in to uh, you know, create characters based on people who actually lived and died. Right. Um, so so the, the, the ethical question of uh, how, how far can we go creating right. a fictional universe That's right. uh, that for a cause. That's right. Um, I, I was very careful the names of my characters. I looked up I looked up their names in the Holocaust victim databases to make sure I wasn't using a name of a real victim. Right? Um, I had to sort of make sure that I would I was playing this dance between fiction and history. Um, everything that happens in public happened in history. So the minute trucks hit the road at 5.35 a.m. on Saturday, uh, February uh, 28th, 1943, whatever it was, that is the moment that the trucks hit the road in history and in the novel. So everything that you see, everything that they're eating, um, every street they go on. When I was looking at Google Maps, one of my colleagues said, you need to make sure that the, uh, the space of the book is are they turning right? Are they turning left? If they're walking down the street, how long is it taking? And I went to Google Maps, and I realized I was looking at a map in the present day. And then amazingly, Google Earth has this historical feature, mm -hmm. and you can scroll back. And then I used a map from 1943 to make sure that the bridges and the roads and the buildings were all in the right place. Mm -hmm. uh, that was kind of fun and, and yeah, wild fascinating. Uh, and fascinating. And then there are other moments. Um, there's a character, for example, in... Uh, so the, the book is called Train. There's no, no surprises that one character at one point in the book is put onto a rail car by the Nazis. Uh, by it, good to meet you, thank you. Um, and I was very, it was one of the last scenes I wrote because I was very scared. How do I write a rail car scene when El Rizal and others warn us that we can never truly understand the experience of someone who is being swept up in mass murder. And so I decided in those scenes where the suffering is extreme, I avoided describing the character's emotions. I only describe what was happening, and it's up to the reader to figure out how the character must be responding emotionally. Because I don't know really how people responded in those moments. I can only describe what we know from testimony. That is fascinating because um, we talk about that, that I, I do and teach narrative ethics. Yes. And uh, you know, one of the arguments is that, okay, we may never be able to, and this comes from Martha Nussbaum, um, we may never be able to experience other people's lives, and we can't because we're locked in our own minds and we have our own, only our own life. But it is through fiction, through some author who actually uh, imagines how it must feel, which is legitimate. That's what authors do. It is the Imagines what it meant, and then we can approximate it. It's only going to be an approximation. It's right? never going to be the, the, right. Exact, that's right. the exact experience. But it's better than not understanding it. That's right. what, so, 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 so what's my solution? There's one character, again, I'm not going to give things away. There's one character who spends the first three quarters of the book trying to uh, escape arrest, escape Nazi arrest. And this, I'm even trying to avoid using uh, uh, pronouns. Uh, this character, um, uh, in, the, in those moments when this character is free, we get to see how this character feels. And we get a sense of who this character is. And we get a sense of this character's ambitions and likes and dislikes. And then the moment that the arrest comes and this character is then swept into the Nazi, onto the Nazi train, and into the Nazi camp system. It's when I decided I would not describe any emotion, but because we've got to know this character really well in the first three quarters of the book, I don't think I needed to describe this character's emotion because it's all implied. And so we can, I don't, I think it's okay as readers, it's okay for, for my readers to, Imagine it's okay when we're reading a novel or when we're 
watching a film, I think it's okay to put ourselves in the shoes of people and say, well, how, what would I have done? What would I do in these situations? But I don't think it's okay for us to force people to think what they would do. I think we have to only go there if we're ready and, and, and willing to go there, if that makes sense. Um, so it's very much up to the reader of training to figure out how this character might be responding to what's happening. Um, yeah. well, in that case, I think we all want to say thank you thank so you, much. Thank you, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I have to call. Absolutely.